welcome everyone to the David Asker Center for Constitutional Rights Charter at 40 webinar. We are joined today by almost, almost all of the center's past constitutional litigators and residents for comments on the past 40 years of charter litigation. Before I start, I wish to acknowledge that our webinar, webinar emanates for the, from the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, it is the meeting place and home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and thrive on this land. I will note that while our webinar is entitled Charter at 40, it is also the 40th anniversary of Section 35 of the Constitution, which recognized and affirms the Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. One of our speakers will be addressing this today as well. Before I introduce our speakers, some technical points. We have a number of speakers today, so for ease of viewing and to be certain who is speaking, you might want to switch your Zoom screen to speaker view. You can find the button to click on the upper right hand side of your screen and you can just view, you can toggle between either gallery or speaker view. We hope to have some time for questions at the end. You can type your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. To begin, the Constitutional Litigators in Residence pro program at the Asper Center is also experiencing a momentous occasion with the appointment of our 10th litigator in residence, Jessica Orkin of Goldblatt Partners LLP. All of our litigators in residence are pre present today with the exception of two. Rajanan, our, our 2015 appointee, was very sad to tell me at the last minute that he could not attend due to the scheduling of a hearing. But most significantly felt is the absence of our first litigator in residence and the person who started the whole thing, Joseph Arve, QC. The Canadian constitutional community and the broader legal community felt or suffered a sad blow with the sudden death of Joe Arve. Many of the cases that will be discussed today involved him in some capacity, whether as counsel for a party or an intervener. He represented the Asper Center in our intervention in Bedford v. Canada on the important issue of the role of precedent in constitutional litigation. He spent only a month in our clinic, but made a lasting impression on the students and on me. As Kent Roach said in his Supreme Court Law Review article entitled, Joe's Justice, Substantive Procedural and Remedial Equality, so many lawyers and organizations had come to rely on him as the living embodiment of access to justice and equality. I will be remarking on a couple of Joe's cases later in our discussion. So now to our speakers. Joe set the expectations high for our constitutional litigator in residence program. And those expectations have been met by the people speaking here today. Their detailed biographies can be found at the link that will be posted in the chat. So I am going to give you only the briefest of introductions before I turn the discussion over to them. Each has chosen a particular area of constitutional law and a couple of significant cases that illustrate the development of the Canadian constitutional landscape since 1982. They will proceed in this order. First, we have Nader Hassan, partner at Stockwood LLP. He practices criminal, regulatory, and constitutional law at the trial and appellate level, levels. He'll be followed by Mary Eberts, Canadian constitutional lawyer and human rights advocate. Recognition of her work includes appointment as an officer of the Order of Canada. She was influential in the creation of Section 50, 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms the founding member of the Women's Legal and Edu Action and Education Fund, LEAF, and she served as litigation counsel for the Native Women's Association of Canada for over 20 years. Next up would be will be Jonathan Rudin, Program Director and Senior Lawyer at Aboriginal Legal Services. Jonathan has written and spoken widely on issues of ind Indigenous justice. Next, Justice Brees Davis, appointed to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in 2018. Prior to her appointment, she maintained a criminal, constitutional, and human rights law practice. Then Susan Ursel, constitutional litigator in residence in 2018. She, was a she is a senior partner with the law firm of Ursel Phillips Fellows Hopkinson LLP. She's a labor and human rights lawyer and frequent speaker, teacher, and writer on human rights and charter issues, followed by Janet Miner. Uh, former general counsel in the constitutional law branch of the Ministry of the Attorney General of Ontario and former treasurer of the Law Society of, of Ontario. Next, John, John, Justice John Norris, sorry, appointed to the Federal Court of Canada in 2018. 
prior to his appointment, he maintained a trial and appellate practice in the areas of criminal, constitutional, and national security. And finally, um, Jessica Orkin, whom I already mentioned as our 10th um, constitutional litigator in residence, partner at Goldblatt Partners with a broad litigation practice, including criminal, civil, and administrative law matters with an emphasis on constitutional rights, human rights, and Aboriginal rights. And I will be, I'll um, bring up the rear and talk about and, and give my um, remarks at the end. So over to you, Nader, and um, welcome to everybody. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Cheryl, for inviting me. And thank you to the Asper Center for putting on this great event. To borrow a turn of phrase from legendary football coach John Madden, if you ask me to pick the most consequential charter right, I don't know that I could. But if I had to pick one, it might just be Section 7 of the Charter. I'm going to talk about Section 7 and the BC Motor Vehicle Reference. The alluring thing about Section 7 of the Charter is its breadth, both in its plain reading and it, in its application during the Charter's first 40 years, as well as its promise for the future. The right to life, liberty and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice has given us constitutional rights across every sphere of Canadian public life and society. I'm speaking of constitutional rights ranging from the independence and impartiality of the judiciary, the principle that criminal liability requires a guilty mind, solicitor client privilege, the principle against government conduct that shocks the conscience. These may well have been rights and principles that existed in common law, but they achieve constitutional entrenchment through section seven of the charter. And then there are all of those rights to ensure fairness in the criminal process. And we'd be here all day if I were to list all of the section seven rights that are necessary to make our criminal justice system work. The right against self-incrimination, see the Queen and PMB, the right to pretrial silence, Queen and Hebert, the confessions rule, Oikel, the right to make full answer and defense, to name just a few. These are absolutely fundamental rights, but aren't specifically enumerated in the charter. They find life in the section seven principles of fundamental justice. Now, some might point out that the expansive era of section seven took place in large part uh, during the Dixon and Lemaire quilts, that is the first 20 years of the charter. But one of the most important Section 7 innovations occurred more recently uh, during the, the McLaughlin Court. Uh, the recognition of what some refer to as the constitutionalization of proportionate lawmaking, that laws that deprive us of life, liberty, or security of the person must not be arbitrary, overbroad, or grossly disproportionate in relation to their purpose. And that innovation, the recognition of arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality has led to the striking down of a number of unfair laws. From the Insight case, invalidating government action in relation to safe injection sites, to Bedford, striking down criminal code prohibitions that made sex workers unsafe, to Carter, striking down laws that prevent physician-assisted suicide, and Safarzade Markali striking down laws limiting pretrial custody credit for criminal detainees. But none of these Section 7 developments, that is the recognition and constitutionalization of all of these substantive rights and principles, none of that would have been possible but for 
the Supreme Court of Canada's seminal decision in the BC Motor Vehicles reference. BC Motor Vehicles was a 1985 decision from Chief Just from Justice Lemaire, as he then was. And in that case, the court was asked to interpret the term principles of fundamental justice. The government in that case urged that the seemingly open-ended term principles of fundamental justice should be understood in a more limited way, that it should be understood as natural justice or procedural fairness, which were well-known terms of art at the time. In other words, the government's position was that Section 7 should ensure a fair process where life, liberty, or security of the person was at stake, but that Section 7 should not include substantive rights, including those very substantive rights I've uh, mentioned. The defense urged that Section 7 included much more and that it has a substantive dimension. And the debate in BC motor vehicles was eerily reminiscent of a US debate that had been raging south of the border for many years regarding whether the due process clause of the US Bill of Rights should also include so-called substantive due process. The charter's drafters, no longer, no, no, no doubt keenly aware of that debate, avoided the language of due process and instead used this new term principles of fundamental justice. Justice Lemaire seized upon that. He reasoned, hey, if the charter's framers wanted me to make applesauce, they wouldn't have given me oranges. That is, if the principles of fundamental justice were supposed to be limited to due process or procedural fairness, that would have been reflected in the language of the provision. These were well-known terms at the time. But instead, the charter's drafters used this new term, principles of fundamental justice, presumably to foreclose the American style debate and foreclose this notion that principles of fundamental justice were limited to natural justice. Justice Lemaire also pointed to the internal structure of the charter. Section seven and sections eight through 14 are all under the heading of legal rights. And it appears that sections eight to 14 are specific illustrations of the principles of fundamental justice. And it would be odd if the illustrations of the right in sections eight to 14 were broader than the general open-ended clause in section seven. And he concluded, and I quote here, for these reasons, I am of the view that it would be wrong to interpret the term fundamental justice as being synonymous with natural justice as the attorney general and others have suggested. To do so would strip the protected interests of much, if not most of their content and leave the right to life, liberty, and security of the person in a sorely emaciated state. So the term principles of fundamental justice was given this broad, liberal, and pers purpose purposive interpretation, and section seven thereafter includes substantive rights. Now, I don't think that even Chief Justice Lemaire could have predicted how Section 7 would flourish as a result of that decision in the BC Motor Vehicles reference. And with the open textured nature of Section 7, there remains scope for further growth. Granted, the courts have been slow to embrace so-called positive rights within Section 7 with Gosselin remaining the leading case in that area. Uh, but that reluctance to embrace positive rights may soon be changing. Already, council and academics across the country are marshalling Section 7 in the service of crafting arguments to challenge government action and inaction on climate change. Various litigants across the country have been urging the courts to recognize that Section 7 protects a positive right to a stable climate. And that battle um, and the battle for other positive rights 
may usher in the next wave of Section 7 innovation. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nader. Our, our next speaker is uh, Mary Eberts. Thank you very much. And I apologize in advance if my assistant, the mighty dog uh, Freya, a great Dane, uh, intrudes into this presentation. I've tried to uh, keep her as far away from the mic as possible, but you know, she's a great Dane. She's bigger than I am. So uh, the case I want to discuss today is Andrews versus the Law Society of BC, the first decision of the Supreme Court of Canada interpreting section 15 of the charter, which provides that every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law. Having been involved in uh, trying to frame some of the language of section 15, I was pleased to be uh, one of the counsel for LEAF in its intervention in Andrews. And one of the uh, particular elements of this case that I want to talk about today is substantive equality. Treatment of section 15 in the charter itself reflects the view that as Chief Justice McLaughlin would later say, equality is the most difficult right. Section 15 did not come into effect with the rest of the charter in 1982, but rather in 1985. In that three-year hiatus, it was envisioned that governments would conduct statute audits, discovering legislation in violation of Section 15 and repairing or replacing it. History shows that these government statute audits were very poorly done. And so the litigation agenda for Section 15, once it did come into effect, was a heavy one. Government reluctance to address equality issues between 1982 and 1985 seems to be at odds with the legislative and policy commitment to human rights and anti-discrimination, which was well underway to deepening at that time. By the time the language of section 15 was being developed in 1980 and 1981, there had been wide acceptance of human rights legislation in Canada, characterizing a wide range of behavior as unacceptable, as well as acceptance of specific legislation passed addressing the violation of the rights of particular groups like women. The language of Section 15 was crafted against the background and experience of this human rights legislation and specific remedial legislation, as well as with reference to experience seeking to apply the Canadian Bill of Rights passed in 1960 by the Diefenbaker government. It is from this history and not in the first instance from the Andrews decision itself that we derive the concept of substantive equality. The Supreme Court of Canada's Bedard and Lavelle decision held that the Canadian Bill of Rights provided a sort of equality in process. As long as a statute affecting a particular group was applied evenly to that group, it did not matter that the statute treated that group differently in substance from others indeed more unfavorably or invidiously compared with others. And so the differentiation between process rights and substance or substantive rights was very much in play when advocates worked to craft the phraseology of section 15. The process right in section 15 is the right to be equal before the law, the right to be equal under the law and the rights to the equal protection and benefit of the law all address substantive equality. That is equality in the substance of the law and not simply in how it is applied. The language protection protecting substantive rights was sought by equality advocates to counteract the disappointing results in the Bedard and Lavelle case, as well as the case of Stella Bliss. As Leaf wrote in its Factum in Andrews, section 15 shows an intention that the equality guarantees of section 15 should reach not only process, but also the substance of the law. The early decisions of the Supreme Court under the charter laid important groundwork for the court's reasoning about substantive equality in Andrews. In Oaks, the court identified equality as one of the fundamental values of society against which the objects of all legislation must be measured. 
the court acknowledged the importance of promoting the equality of particular groups in Big M, among others. In Big M, it also decided that the interests of true equality may require differentiation in treatment rather than the same treatment. And so we see not only an insistence on attention to the substance of the law, as well as its process, but also a, an insistence that the guarantees of substantive equality were intended to benefit individuals and groups which historically had had unequal access to social and economic resources, either because of overt discrimination or because of the adverse effects of apparently neutral forms of social organization premised on the subordination of certain groups and the domination of others. The decision of Mr. Justice McIntyre in the Anders case in particular, built on the court's previous jurisprudence, as well as the significant social and policy commitment to equality and anti-discrimination, which had informed the drafting of section 15. It recognized specifically that the section is intended to address inequality in substance, as well as in process, citing both the Lavelle and Brooks cases as ones that section 15 was intended to overcome. The court cautioned against legislation which is facially neutral, stressing the importance of looking at the impact of apparently neutral legislation. Andrews then is not so much an innovation as an affirmation of the knowledge and commitment to the equality of disadvantaged persons. This commitment to substantive equality was reaffirmed again by Justice Abella in the Fraser case, in which she outlines the development of the concept in judicial decisions and scholarship since Andrews. There have been admittedly some serious departures in the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence from this basic understanding of and commitment to substantive equality. But with Fraser, it can reasonably be stated that tr the trajectory from before Andrews and through it to greater substantive equality is once again on a sure footing. Thank you very much, Mary. And now following up with more about section 15, I believe it will be Jonathan Rubin. Uh, thanks very much, Cheryl, and uh, hi to everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and uh, have a chance to think about the most significant charter case in the last 40 years. Uh, when Cheryl contacted me, I had my case immediately picked out, and it was Sharma, a decision of the Supreme Court that has not yet been issued. And so I was prepared to be incredibly happy about it and talk about how significant it was, but we don't have the decision yet. I also reserve the right to be bitterly disappointed, but I am I am holding that in check. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Sharma, but I am going to pick up on something both Nodder and Mary talked about. The case I'm focusing in on is Eldridge, 1997 unanimous decision of uh, the Supreme Court by Justice Laforet. And, and Eldridge gave meaning uh, in a way that had not been before to this idea of substantive equality. Like, what does it actually mean? So Mary obviously is right about everything that she talks about, but uh, she's certainly right that um, in Andrews, the court said, no, this is not formal equality. We're concerned with substantive equality. But what does that mean in practice? And Eldridge was a great example of what it means. So. Um, Many of you will be familiar with it, but it's not the most famous charter case. So Eldridge involved three uh, individuals from British Columbia who were deaf. And the facts of the case actually do matter a bit. The facts of all these cases actually do matter a bit. We tend to forget them later, but some of the facts help explain the, the case. So in BC, uh, people who were deaf had access to sign language interpreters when they went to uh, the doctors. But that sign language interpreting was not provided by the state. It was provided by a nonprofit organization. And it cost about $150,000 a year to provide this service, which isn't a lot of money. But the BC government decided to stop funding it for name whatever reason you want to give. But the ostensible reason they gave was, in fact, an equality justification. They said, well, 
we can't keep doing this for blind people or deaf people, sorry, because what about all the other people who don't speak English, for example, the first language? So we can't, we can't provide this service. And so we're not going to. And so um, the plaintiffs in the case said, this violates our rights to equality. And when the case got to the Supreme Court, it was interesting to see how it was argued because the, the BC government argued, we don't deny that deaf people suffer and are treated much less well in the Canadian system. And there's all sorts of evidence provided about the economic impacts that, in, that deaf people don't have the same access to, to jobs and all sorts of things. And there were incredible uh, affidavits from the applicants themselves about what it's like to be uh, in front of a doctor, especially if you're having uh, a medical procedure and no one can speak to you. And so BC government said, yeah, so we accept all of this, but we didn't make you deaf. Like you were deaf. That's not, I'm, that's, that's a reality, but it's not our fault. And we can't be responsible to fix this. We have to treat everyone the same. And we do because in our healthcare system, everyone has access to the same level of healthcare. Everyone has the right to get doctors and the same procedures and all of that. We're not at all picking on deaf people and not giving them the services they want. And the Supreme Court said, there's a problem with your analysis. And the problem with the analysis you're bringing is our healthcare system is premised on the notion that you can communicate effectively with your doctor because you can do so in English or in French, the two official languages in the country. And that's just baked into the system. And that's an assumption that's baked into the system. And deaf people don't have that. And when people who are among a disadvantaged group, whatever term we wanna use, do not have the same things that the advantaged group has, that can still be a denial of equality. That equality is not just, does this disadvantaged group receive what that disadvantaged group receives, but rather we look to what the majority of society has and we look to that as the example. Do they have equality and how do we give that level of equality to people who uh, suffer disabilities? And so that was a different way of thinking about equality, made substantive equality real. And that decision, I think, was incredibly significant. Just a, a year or two later, the Supreme Court in Vreend decided the issue of gay and lesbian rights on the same basis that, that uh, in Alberta, you couldn't use the Human Rights Code if you were fired because of your sexual orientation and the Alberta government said, yeah, but we treat gays and lesbians the same as everyone else. If they're denied housing because of their color, they can use uh, the, uh, the human rights code. But the, the, the Supreme Court said, uh, Justices uh, Yakubuchi in court said, yeah, but that's not, what, that's not what equality means for these people. And so if you're giving people equality, you have to give everybody equality. And so Eldridge was really significant. It did, to some extent, portend a move to a more positive rights regime. And a lot of those um, dreams were dashed uh, later on. But it was a significant case um, because it, it, it established what substantive equality means. But the other thing about it is, and now I'm going to get to talk about what Nader had discussed, it also exposed and has exposed uh, a real division in how applicants deal with breaches of equality. If it's a criminal matter, the tendency has been not to use section 15, but rather to use section seven. And so as I have argued other, elsewhere, I love that phrase, as I have argued elsewhere. Um, as I've argued elsewhere, um, well, if you talk about legislation being overbroad or arbitrary, often what you're talking about is that it is 
the legislation doesn't capture the group it is supposed to capture. Either it doesn't capture them or it excludes them or whatever. And those are really often equality arguments. They are equality arguments, which we, instead of arguing on the basis of equality, we say overbroad or arbitrary. And this distinction between the way we use section seven and the way we use section 15 is really starkly shown in Carter, which was a decision that Joe Arve was um, at the, at the head of, and he it was brilliant decision, brilliant case in which he argued, and this is the case obviously um, for assisted suicide. He argued that the fact that people with disabilities didn't have access to, to suicide they couldn't do it on their own and therefore they were breaching the criminal law that violated both their rights under section 15 and their rights under section 7 the supreme court dodged the 15 issue they just did it was before them they I mean let's face it the only group of people who need assistance with suicide are those people who can't undertake it on their own and those are people as the evidence showed who had disabilities but the court ducked the 15 argument said well we don't have to decide that because we're going to decide it under section 7 and we're going to say that the law is arbitrary and it's overbroad it's well, it's not overbroad it's arbitrary and and that's how we're going to decide the case and so on the one hand for people who advocated, were advocating for uh, medical assistance in dying, who cares whether it's section 15 or section seven? What matters is the Supreme Court struck the law down and that is very true. But I do think there is a difference between what happens when a law is struck down under section 15 and when it's struck down under section seven. And when a law is struck down under section seven, it is perceived as a tailoring question. We didn't cut the cloth quite too much. It's too arbitrary or it's too overbroad. We'll just trim it here or we'll do this or we'll do that. And it makes it seem that it is, it's not about anything hugely fundamental. It's about a tailoring issue. But when something is struck down because it violates someone's equality rights, then it's much harder, I think, for governments to argue that the law can be justified and it's okay if we allow certain problems to remain because what you're then saying is it's okay to discriminate against people. So I think Eldridge is significant because it established the notions of substantive equality. I think the divergence between section 15 and seven can be understood because section 15 is just hard and it's really hard in the criminal context. But I think it it is, I think we need to think about Section 15 more in the criminal context. And that's, in fact, what was attempted in Sharma. And we'll see what happens. And we'll leave it at that cliffhanger moment. And I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That's fascinating. We, will, we are very anxious to hear what's going to happen in Sharma. The Asper Center did intervene in that case. So. Um, we have some skin in the game. But uh, our next speaker is Justice Davis. Thank you Over so much, you. Cheryl. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for organizing this and inviting us all back. I'm going to start with uh, my obligatory disclaimer, which is um, I, the, I'm going to express my personal views on issues. I am obviously not speaking on behalf of the court. Uh, I've chosen to focus my time on the issue of how the court has dealt with uh, the concept of privacy under Section 8 of the Charter. Of course, Section 7 also finds a home from time to time uh, in the jurisprudence under Section 7, but I'm going to be looking at how that issue uh, has been developed uh, under Section 8. And the reason that I've chosen privacy is because, in my view, our democracy is premised, at least in large part, on the idea um, that there are limits on the government's power to pry into our private lives. And so like Nader and Mary, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. And the case that I've chosen to at least start with is a very early charter decision from 1984 in Hunter and Southam, um, which 
uh, set the course uh, in many ways for how our privacy rights uh, would be shaped and defined in the 40, or I guess 38 years after that. Of course, Hunter and Southern was about the Combines Investigation Act, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, um, which allowed anyone authorized uh, by the director to enter any premise and examine anything and make copies of any records. Um, and all they required was authorization from the commission under which uh, the director operated. Um, and the authorization could be based solely on the belief of the director that the, the search would be uh, fruitful. Of course, many of us think of Hunter and Southern as establishing this test for requiring reasonable and probable grounds for a valid search. We also think of Hunter and Southern as setting the requirement uh, for the need for prior independent judicial authorization for searches and invasions of privacy but it also planted the seed in a large part um, on how privacy would come to be defined uh, over the years that followed. Um, the court in Hunter and Southern used the concept of a living tree to distinguish the charter uh, from other legislation. And what the court said uh, is that the task of interpreting a constitution is crucially different from construing a statute, what the court said was, quote, a statute defines present rights and obligations. It's easily enacted and easily repelled. A constitution, by contrast, is drafted with an eye to the future. Its function is to provide a continuing framework for the legislate, for the legitimate exercise of government power. Um, the court also talked about the charter, well, the constitution and the charter uh, needing to be capable of growth and development over time to meet social, political, and historical realities um, that might have been unimaginable to the framers of the constitution. But from my perspective, for what I'm talking about today, I think one of the most important things that came out of the Hunter and Southern case in terms of our understanding of privacy is that the court rejected a narrow understanding of privacy uh, that was premised on the notion of private property, um, which had really developed under the British common law. And they adopted um, a more American framework or in a more American approach to the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure that was premised on protecting people as, a as opposed to protecting property. And so it was seen um, to be the right to be left alone by the state, uh, which is obviously how we now define concepts of privacy. And in Hunter and Southern, Justice Dixon articulated what really has become the question, uh, which still animates most of the discussions that we still have about privacy, which is whether a particular situation or sorry, whether in a particular situation, the public's interest in being left alone by the government should or needs to give way to the government's interest in intruding on our privacy to advance its goals, which are most often law enforcement. And we see that theme um, from Hunter and Southern return and evolve in, the, in almost every section eight case that comes after it. Um, and we see how the concept of privacy has grown. So another case would be the Queen Implant from 1993 with the perimeter searches, which builds on Hunter and Southern and recognizes the three different domains of privacy that we now understand being personal, territorial, and informational. And in terms of the informational domain of privacy, I think that's one of the most challenging that we've had in terms of how to understand it. But in Plant, the court decided or described informational privacy as protecting that biographical core of information that we would all want to be able to control or keep private from the government. And informational pr privacy really focuses on those intimate details of our lives and our lifestyle and our personal choices. One of the biggest challenges I think uh, in, the, in this area is how to understand and protect privacy as technology makes it more and more and more easy for information to be collected and accessed by the state. 
and that idea of the use of privacy or the use of technology to gather information about us was really first highlighted by the Supreme Court of Canada and the Queen in Tesling in 2004, a decision by Justice Binney. Um, obviously that looked at the forward looking infrared technology. I had to remind myself of what the technology was, but it's the technology that could detect, allow the government to detect heat and light distribution on the surface of buildings, which had all to do with grow ops. Um, and uh, I mean, it seems sort of quaint now that the big fight was about heat profiles, given what information is gathered about us, but uh, that was what it was about. Um, and the court in that case had to really look at the technology and the use of technology and, and the court recognized or um, that as technology develops, um, it will become more and more obvious why privacy um, should not be tethered to property rights. Because as technology allows for invasions of privacy that are unconnected to owning property, there's a need to continue to protect privacy without focusing on ownership and property rights. Um, and there was also a recognition by the court that as the technology uh, evolves and advances, it will allow for greater and greater intrusions into our privacy. The court in Tesling was really clear to reject the idea that advances in technology means that our privacy, the sphere of privacy should shrink. Um, and the court also, again, recognized the need to balance privacy with um, effective policing. Um, and the new version of Justice Dixon's question from Hunter became how much information about ourselves are we allowed to protect um, in the face of a state interest uh, to collect information. Um, I think Tesling really foreshadowed one of the biggest problems or challenges or tensions that continues to exist in the area of privacy interests. Because on the one hand, the court recognized that privacy interests are normative, not descriptive. Pri privacy interests is about what we should or, um, or could expect in terms of our relationship with the state, that the, role, the court has a role in shaping what that sphere of privacy should be. But on the other hand, the court declined in Tesling to consider what technology may be able to do in the future and only looked at the existing um, capabilities of the technology. And what the court said is that, that they will, the court will deal with advances in technology as they happen when the facts are known. Um, and so you can almost think of FLUR as sort of a very primitive version of modern drone technology, but the court was very clear that they weren't gonna think about what the future of any particular technology might look like. They're only gonna look at the iteration that was before them, which by definition is gonna be several years old by the time it gets to the Supreme Court. Um, and so the result of that approach, which may be, correct from a jurisprudential perspective is that Supreme Court decisions often lag behind advances in technology. Um, and it's one of the challenges, I think, of using the court as the, as the arbiter of, of normative principles about privacy. So for example, it wasn't until 2012 that the court considered whether we have an expectation of privacy in our work computers and in the Queen and Coal. It wasn't in 2000 and, uh, 10 that they talked about um, searching computer, searching computers found in other areas, or sorry, computers seized uh, when they execute other search warrants in the Queen and Vu. It wasn't until 2017 that they dealt with searches of cell phones incident to arrest. Uh, it wasn't until 2017 in Morocco where they talked about um, how to conceive of privacy in an age of ubiquitous electronic communications where there's a permanent, permanent record. Um, and so if I sort of look forward to the next 40 years of charter litigation in this area, uh, I think there will be continuous challenges to how we should conceive of privacy as new technology emerges. You can think of things like uh, IMSI catcher technologies, which can interfer, interrupt cell phone, 
AI driven technology like facial recognition or iris recognition, AI driven predictive uh, predictions of human technology, or sorry, of human behavior and the possibilities of potential profiling or discrimination based on the assumptions made by the algorithms uh, that underlie the uh, artificial intelligence, the internet of things and data collection, you know, are the consents that we all sign when we sign up for, uh, to have a device that we can speak to in our homes that's gonna tell us everything we wanna know. Um, do, does that mean that, what, what's the meaning of the consents we provide with those? And so I think as technology advances, um, it will continue to challenge the court's ability, broadly speaking, um, to, to, um, to shape our understanding of privacy in a way that's responsive to uh, new advances and to be able to be the arbiter of normative issues of privacy. Thank you very much, Justice Davis. Uh, our next speaker is Susan Ursel. Thanks, Cheryl. And I'm just going to do what all good labor lawyers do. I'm going to put my notes up on the screen there for everyone to see. Um, thanks for inviting me to talk about um, cases of significance from the Supreme Court of Canada with respect to the evolution of the charter. I've chosen uh, and shamelessly ripped off some classic literature here, the story of two trilogy labor rights at the SCC. Um, and I want to talk to you about them because I think they are, uh, they offer a completely different lens from which to look at these rights, a lens that isn't often seen uh, in some of the cases that we've been talking about so far. And that lens is the tension between individual rights, which are enshrined in the charter, of course, and we're well aware of them, and the rights of the collectivity, the rights of association. And of course, freedom of association is enshrined at section 2D of the charter and the language is there for you all to see. Now, the reason I wanna take these two trilogies, which uh, are anchored in 1987 in the early years in the Dixon court in the early years, of charter interpretation and uh, a series of trilogy in 2015 is because they illustrate the evolution of the court's thinking, but they also illustrate the continuing tension between these two poles, these two things that we conceive of as opposites. Um, and they attempt to, um, well, they reflect the developing courts, the courts developing thinking on this. The original 87 trilogy involved the Alberta reference which engaged uh, with legislation which prohibited strikes and imposed compulsory interest arbitration. Compulsory interest arbitration in the labor world, for those of you who are not familiar, is where when you cannot resolve your collective bargaining problems, you are uh, sent to an interest arbitrator who will adjudicate upon the broad components of your collective agreement and render a decision. Peace Act versus Canada dealt with wage and compensation restraint legislation, wage control, something that we're familiar with because we just had Bill 124. The litigation in that case was just heard in September in the Ontario Superior Court. I'll talk a bit about that later. But Peace Act was an earlier wage and compensation restraint piece of litigation, and it had the object of restricting inflation for two years. There were no interest arbitration provisions in it. No strikes were permitted. Retail wholesale and department store union, department store workers union in Saskatchewan was uh, legislation that temporarily prohibited strikes and lockouts in the dairy industry. So the cluster of issues in, these, in this first trilogy were characterized as being about collective bargaining and about collective bargaining as an associational activity by human beings and whether or not it was protected by the charter and also the use of the strike weapon as leverage in a frankly economic dispute where um, I will I will lay all my cards on the table I work for trade unions where the power imbalance is usually quite vast between that of the employees even in association and their employer. The key takeaway from this first set of trilogies was that freedom of association is a right invested in the individual. It's not a group right. And this was an analysis proffered by the majority in the court, which did not include the chief justice at the time. And I'm gonna to come to that as well. 
The fact of association itself does not by itself confer additional rights, any additional rights on individuals, said the majority. And the right to strike, which is primarily an economic weapon, reserve, uh, uh, obtained no protection by Section D under freedom of association, nor did the right to collectively bargain. Although the door was sort of left out in the P open in the PSAC case that some other aspects um, un undefined of collective bargaining might receive protection sometimes, somewhere, somehow, as I say in this slide. The key takeaway from Chief Justice Dixon's dissent, and I want to emphasize this because it is the foundation for the change, for the evolution in thinking in the court that was manifest in the 2015 trilogy, is that freedom of association does include the freedom to bargain collectively and does include the right to strike. Um, he also found that the Section 1 did not afford the Alberta reference case any protection. The limitations were not, uh, were not minimally impairing. Uh, sorry, the limitations for my dog, Mary, my dog is now barking its head off, so you're not alone. Um, she's a lot smaller than yours, though. Section one did not offer uh, a, def uh, 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 a defense to the government as the legislation was not minimally impairing. Um, and this case involved all hospital workers and public service employees who were prohibited from striking. And, and Dixon said that's too drastic a measure. Um, and then went on to consider the essential services and what the nature of essential services were and whether or not these were truly essential services in which the right to strike should be prohibited. This is again an issue top of mind as we watch education bargaining in the education sector in Ontario this fall. The essential philosophical differences are, are really quite set out quite well by Justice McIntyre. And I, I just wanna refer you to a couple of quotes. In considering the constitutional position of freedom of association, he wrote, it must be recognized that while it advances many group interests and of course cannot be exercised alone, it is nonetheless a freedom belonging to the individual and not to the group form through its exercise. So there was a complete erasure of the concept of group rights and people, uh, the justice went on to write, by merely combining together cannot create an entity which has greater constitutional rights and freedoms than they as individuals possess. Freedom of association cannot therefore vest independent rights in the groups. It doesn't protect all activities that are essential to the goals of an association. And it, it had a very derivative, as, as it described in the jurisprudence, a derivative um, uh, scope or ambit of protection in that freedom of association is uh, interpreted to mean that charter protection will attach to the exercise in the association of such rights as have charter protection when exercised by the individual. This hyper individualistic attitude um, evinced by the majority of the court was really reflective of the tenor of the times. And while I don't think that they were necessarily channeling Margaret Thatcher, it is remarkable that she said <laughs> around about the same time that these decisions were being rendered, I have a problem. It is the government's job to cope with it. Or I have a problem. I will go and get a grant to cope with it. I am homeless. The government must house me, she said in an interview in a woman's magazine. And so she said they are casting their problems on society. And who is society? There is no such thing. There are individual men and women and there are families and no government can do anything except through people and people look to themselves first. This was the tenor of the times. This was the hyper individualistic approach of the times. And I think Margaret captured it rather well, although somewhat objectionably. We had Reaganomics and trickle down theories. We had a rising tide lifts all boats theories of the economy. We had stagflation, double digit interest rates and the Berlin Wall was still standing until 1989 as was the USSR, which didn't dissolve till 1991. Why am I mentioning all this? Because in the context of the cases that I'm looking at, Context is very important. And when the, when the government introduces legislation that restricted labor rights in this time period, the context, stagflation, double digit interest rates, these kinds of issues played a large role in the court's analysis, particularly at section one. Here's the essential philosophical difference from the dissenting view in the court. 
the, uh, Chief Justice Dixon said, in every area of human endeavor and throughout history, individuals have formed associations for the purpose of common interests and aspirations. Through association, individuals are able to ensure that they have a voice in shaping the circumstances integral to their needs, rights, and freedoms. And then went on to say freedom of association is the cornerstone of modern labor relations. Historically, workers have combined to overcome the inherent inequalities of bargaining power in the employment relationship and to protect themselves from unfair, unsafe, or exploitive work conditions. So he elucidated clearly the tension between the individual and the associational, and he struck a different balance. Now, um, I won't go through all the quotes because we don't have time, but I'm sure Cheryl can post these um, uh, quotations and, and um, my PowerPoint online later on. In the intervening years between 87 and 2015, we saw an ebb and flow of analysis of collectivity and its rights on, as protected or not protected under the Charter. In the Dunmore case, there was consideration of the situation of agricultural workers who were excluded from labor relation regimes, and there was a constitutional requirement that they have some access to some form of protected associational activity in their labor. Health services um, versus British Columbia was a landmark case. It was the first recognition that meaningful collective bargaining and associational activity was protected and in some form started the shift away from the 80, 1987 hyper-individualistic approach to associational rights. Um, it introduced to a rather confusing or confounding concept of the need for consultation or the salutary effects of consultation should the government limit our, uh, our constitutional rights to freedom of association. And it introduced this at the level of the analysis of the breach of the right itself. This is the kind of an analytical framework that has been resisted strongly in Section 15 cases, but has found its way mm, through, some, uh, through some admittedly sparse commentary by the court in this case, um, but it's found its way into the analysis. The Fraser case was a further elaboration of the situation of agricultural workers, and it established that there's no one model of labor relations that will be protected, but there were certain features of labor relations, uh, particularly around collective bargaining, and that it must be meaningful. The new 2015 trilogy, completely upended the law on labor relations under Section 2D. Um, it involved the Mounted Police Association, the Saskatchewan Federation of Labor, and the Meredith case. The tenor of the times, I think, has shifted, and I quote Thomas Piketty here, who starts in 1971, uh, belonging to a generation that didn't have time, as he said, to be tempted by communism, but now 30 years later in 2020, admittedly a little past, 2015, hypercapitalism has gone much too far, and I'm now convinced we need to think about a new way of going beyond capitalism, and he elaborates in that in his book, Time for Socialism. Why do I mention that? Because the key takeaways from the 2015 trilogy are that freedom of association does protect the right to join with others and form associations, including to pursue other constitutional rights and meet on more equal terms power in employment relations in particular. It, in, it does protect the right of employees to meaningfully associate and engage in free meaningful collective bargaining. And it does notably protect the right to strike, which is acknowledged by the Supreme Court as an economic weapon and an important one of leverage in a situation where the vast power of most employers outweighs even the collective power of their employees. It's established that Section 2D must be interpreted in purposive and generous fashion. And again, context and outcome may be relevant at the level of a Section 2D analysis, notwithstanding that they're more usually entertained at the Section 1 stage. So we see some high watermarks in this trilogy, some rethinking and some explicit rejection of the earlier majority opinion of the court. And we see the court's analytical processes in action when we look at these two trilogies. And I find it fascinating, both as a lawyer and a history major from a long time ago, to watch how the historic moments in time can help elucidate these rights and principles and help bring um, new viewpoints and new evaluations to the court. 
Um, I won't go through all the characteristics of meaningful collective bargaining, as intriguing as I find them, um, but in deference to uh, the other speakers, I will just skip to the end and tell you that there have been many cases, several of them quite significant, the BC Teachers Federation, OPSU versus Ontario, which was the Bill 115 case, and the most recently argued case of OECTA et al. versus Ontario, which is under reserve, which is a challenge to Bill 124, all dealt with in key and, and essential restrictions on collective bargaining, on the right to strike. Um, and BC Teachers Federation, probably notable for the shortest decision I've ever read of the Supreme Court of Canada, they simply endorsed the dissent below, but that dissent found that restrictions on collective bargaining in legislation in that province were unconstitutional and elaborated and further confounded um, the jurisprudence on the issue of consultation, which is a subject, should be the subject for an entirely different uh, talk about where the concept of consultation belongs in a consideration of the Charter of Rights as opposed to First Nations and Aboriginal litigation, where there is a duty to consult, where there isn't a duty to consult, why it might be there, and so on. So these cases, I think, are um, essential to our understanding of how our society is to function together, both as individuals and in collectivities. And I frankly find them fascinating. And I'm really pleased to have a chance to talk to you about them. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, over to Janet Miner now. Thanks, Cheryl. And hello, everyone. Um, my, excuse me, my uh, choice uh, for discussion is the Oaks test in, of course, the interpretation of section one and what is required to justify uh, an initial infringement under the charter. Uh, section one itself is surely, if not the most important provision, one of the most important provisions of the charter because it is foundational guaranteeing both the rights and uh, the limitations to those rights. The, the section itself requires a balancing of interests uh, of individuals and groups with society. And that balancing is really founded on proportionality, central to, I think, most of the considerations uh, of the courts uh, in charter analysis. And proportionality, I think, has, has really been um, accepted as one of the important principles of constitutions not just in Canada, but abroad. So in Oaks, which uh, is the case I think we all associate with section one, what is happening, it's the section one test. Uh, Justice Dixon and the court provided an interpretation and analysis and methodology, which the court would apply to determine whether a restriction is acceptable. And he identified certain factors, one of the, the key, uh, I think, uh, underlying principles was the uh, primacy of rights. And when this case was initially enunciated, uh, I think there was an immediate uh, assumption that the approach of, of uh, Oaks would be uh, rigorous, that there would be consistent analysis applied and that uh, this would sort of just uh, roll out. However, very shortly after Oaks was released, Edwards Books was heard. And in fact, the ink was barely dry on the Oaks decision when Edwards was argued. The, when the Edwards uh, Books decision was released, it, it did not refer to Oaks at all, but appeared to modify or clarify, depending on your perspective, some of the requirements. And that trend, I think, has continued throughout the application of OAKS. And that is, there are tweaks, there are modifications uh, along the way. I'm going to refer to some of those, but time doesn't permit all of them. Uh, one of the prevailing issues, though, is the evolution, really, of a a uh, standard of deference or a pattern of deference in some challenges, especially respecting uh, the socio and economic legislation or measures. 
And to what degree should there be deference to the legislature? When, how will it be exercised? And that is tied up also with the evidentiary uh, problems uh, in addressing uh, the uh, proportionality uh, analysis by, by anyone trying to defend legislation. Um, I'm saying this by way of introduction. One of the other uh, prevailing threads though uh, was a constant. And that was that uh, in the applying the three-part test um, or four-part, uh, the uh, real work for proportionality was done under minimal impairment. And that became really, as I think uh, Professor Hogg said, the arena uh, for determination. And if we fast forward to the last few years, that approach is now in question. And two different cases, Hutterite, uh, Hutterian Brethren case in 2009 and RVKRJ in 2016, both signal a revisiting of the emphasis in the methodology. The methodology is not changed, but the emphasis has. And so I'll come back to that. So going back now to 1986 and the Oaks test, uh, of course, the court had not yet articulated any uh, organized approach to section one or what test would be approached. And when you look at the uh, headnote of the decision, one of the first things I think you notice is that there, the only counsel present were those for the appellant and the respondent. There was no, uh, no uh, attorney general interveners. There were no uh, interveners uh, through application. Uh, and this is partially, I think, because the case wasn't perceived as one which would focus on uh, such an important analysis of section one. It dealt, as you probably recall, with um, whether or not a reverse onus uh, for the possession of, uh, of uh, drugs, um, whether, the, whether possession of drugs could result in a conviction for trafficking. And there was a reverse onus on the person found to have possessed drugs. And so the focus on in, from a charter perspective was on 11D and the presumption of innocence. Um, the elaboration of the section one test uh, really came from the court. And uh, it was, I think, a somewhat bold initiative, certainly well received by many who were looking for guidance from the court on how one would, would uh, defend uh, legislation or attack it. Um, and uh, it, it simply promulgated it almost uh, I, would, I don't want to say from the head of Zeus, but from the head of, of, uh, of those Supreme Court judges. There were some international sources referred to, although they were as much on the uh, presumption of innocence as how to justify a law. But the justificatory criteria were elaborated. And as I said, the preeminence of rights was stressed that the court uh, uh, regarded the uh, furtherance of values like inherent dignity of the person, commitment to social justice and equality, accommodation of a wide variety of beliefs, respect for cultural groups, identity, uh, and faith in the social and political in institutions, which enhance the participation of individuals and groups in society, I am paraphrasing them only slightly, as the underlying values and principles uh, which are the standard against which a limit had to be met. And then I'll just highlight some of the language they used um, before we get to the actual criteria. They used language like it would be a stringent standard, especially in the context of a violation of rights of fundamental principles. The onus was on the party seeking to uphold, it would be a civil standard. However, it must be in quotes, rigorously applied uh, then they said, well, there may be degrees of, of uh, probability, uh, and it depends on the subject matter. Um, for a charter violation, again, there should be a very high degree of probability, and the evidence must be cogent and persuasive. So with that as background, they also then set out the methodology. 
And again, I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. The first was, uh, is it prescribed by law? And assuming it is, is the government objective pressing and substantial in a free and democratic society? It cannot be trivial or discordant. Once it is sufficiently uh, uh, significant, then uh, the uh, challenger has to, or the defender has to show that uh, it's reasonably reasonable and demonstrably justified, sorry. Um, and that's gonna vary in the circumstances. So it does, the court did say there had to be a balancing. The three components then of proportionality were enunciated. The measure had to be carefully designed to achieve the objective, not arbitrary, unfair, or based on irrational considerations, had to be rationally connected. Even if rationally connected, it should impair the right as little as possible. And then finally, there was a proportionality test between the effects of the measures and the objective which had been identified. So although there was a, some focus on the proportionality, ultimately that became largely subsumed in the uh, considerations of minimal impairment. And I'd just like to mention Edward's books recently because it seemed so surprising that it came out so, it was argued and, and came out so close to Edward's, sorry, close to um, uh, Oaks, and Oaks was never mentioned in it. And it wasn't argued and when the decision came out, there was no indication that it was uh, modifying Oaks in any way, but it was the first step into uh, a more nuanced, I would say, uh, look at the test. And so um, Dixon in that case said that the court um, has been careful to avoid rigid and inflexible standards. And uh, Laferre noticed that in any balancing, there's going to be a detriment to some people and the legislature must be given room to maneuver. What is reasonable will vary in the context. And that is quite different than how a lot of people interpreted their first uh, run at Oaks. Um, so uh, the, uh, again, he agreed with the chief that uh, rigid and inflexible standards were to be avoided. The legislature must be allowed some scope the business of government is practical and must be uh, looked at on a realistic basis, not on abstract uh, theory. And um, the uh, impairment uh, criterion was also tweaked. And so it was required now that the impairment be as little as reasonably possible as opposed to possible. So again, another broadening. Uh, the question would be now, is there a reasonable alternative rather than is the measure the least intrusive? So court watchers who were especially those who had uh, cheered the enunciation of the test in Oaks uh, as uh, a reliable, rigid, well, rigid, let's say, um, strong, uh, principled uh, approach, saw it being weakened. And especially as courts got into considerations involving socio and economic uh, legislation. And one example uh, of that is, uh, is McKinney, the mandatory retirement case where labor uh, relations was looked at, uh, the effects of economic policy decisions, and uh, also in Irwin Toy, which was, uh, as you know, a case about advertising and its effect on children. And in both cases, the courts indicated that deference needed to be given to the government in cases like this, either because the uh, uh, the measure could not be absolutely proven as one which would be successful or which on the other hand was the least impairment. And that is because everything uh, was being regarded from a perspective basis and how can one prove the future? Plus is there uh, the issues of, is there any right, one right uh, economic policy or economic theory? Is there one right labor uh, theory uh, 
And so the court started heading, in these cases at least, towards saying what we really need to know is whether the government has a reasonable basis for concluding that this um, measure will be effective. And is there a reasonable basis for concluding that the right is impaired as little as possible? So the court then tried, I think, to develop strategies which would differentiate the kinds of cases uh, to which deference would be given and what kind of deference. Uh, McKinney, the case I mentioned earlier, also uh, introduced in, in incrementalism, which had not been, um, I'm sorry about that phone, again, <laughs> adopted before. Uh, and the court was uh, prepared to say, the government doesn't have to solve a whole problem at once. It can look at regions, it can look at areas. So with all of this, um, nonetheless, McKinney still has, sorry, Oaks has still uh, been regarded. Oh, I'm sorry, is that interrupting? Okay. Um, the, uh, the court, Oaks has still main, maintained itself uh, in a very resilient way as the test that is still applied. Um, one thread, as I mentioned, however, was that, and this was a, a constant as opposed to an ever-changing uh, approach to deference, uh, and that was that the minimal impairment portion of the, of the uh, uh, tripartite test was the one where work was done. And this was subject to also to criticism, uh, particularly um, from, uh, in fact, a couple of international uh, commentators, one Dieter Grimm, uh, former, uh, formerly of the German Constitutional Court, and President Barack of the Israeli court. And they noted that it was really uh, not intellectually uh, justifiable because it's a different principle that's looked at. Minimal impairment looks at the specific uh, uh, measure and looks at it within itself. Is it a minimal impairment? Whereas the later proportionality required a, a different look. It looked at it at large and looked at the overall weighing of the deleterious effect of infringement of the right and the salutary effects of the measure. So that I think is what has prompted uh, our court now most recently in both Hutterian Brethren and uh, RKJ, KRJ, sorry, uh, to, uh, to attempt to tweak the methodology on, on that uh, approach. And so uh, in Hutterian Brethren, you'll remember that was a case where the Alberta government required a photo uh, on a driver's license, and that was contrary to the beliefs of the Hutterian Brethren. And after reviewing evidence, uh, Justice McLaughlin uh, rejected uh, the theory that uh, minimal impairment uh, and proportionality of effects uh, analysis involve different kinds of balancing. And um, Justice Abella in dissent also said, in my view, most of the heavy conceptual living, lifting and balancing ought to be done at the final step, proportionality proportionality of effects. Proportionality is what section one is all about. And so uh, interestingly, however, in, with that focus, they came to different conclusions uh, on result. And uh, the majority upheld the requirement and the, uh, the dissent would have struck it down. The next case, uh, KRJ um, looked at uh, a requirement uh, which permitted retrospective application of a penalty. Um, and I'm over time, so I'm going to tune out right there. Um, and it again adopted uh, a more focused uh, 
review of the evidence on proportionality, the salutary versus the deleterious effect. And this is, I think, appropriate and has been regarded as a uh, step in the right direction because it makes the analysis more transparent. Uh, the analysis can be different, although some people said, well, it's the last uh, um, requirement was really redundant because you al already have decided everything in the first two. But as has been pointed out, you could have a very drastic uh, infringement that was still the least drastic that you could have, but it might be so drastic that it should not be uh, upheld uh, in the final analysis. And that's what happened in KRJ. And so some people call that the drastic, least drastic problem. In summary, then, what we get is a, uh, I think, uh, an indication that the court's prepared to look at the section one analysis, it has gone so uh, at least to, to, towards making it more transparent. What it has not done, I think, is help us with, again, levels of deference and evidence. And I, so I'm not sure if these two cases are really going to result in substantively different results than we would have before. Uh, transparency, nonetheless, is a virtue, and I think we have to applaud that. Uh, it has been suggested that uh, making the subjective value judgments more transparent uh, may not always uh, uh, be regarded as a positive in that uh, it highlights uh, to some extent the subjectivity involved in section one, but I think that remains to be seen. And I do apologize for taking up too much time, Char uh, Cheryl, um, but um, it is a fascinating topic and uh, with, there's a lot of room still for further development by the court, and I look forward to it. We couldn't have a charter at 40 without discussing the Oaks test, which has <laughs> had a considerable amount of resilience over the years. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, Justice Norris for your remarks. Thanks very much, uh, Cheryl. Uh, like uh, Justice Davis, while I was once a constitutional litigator, I too am now a judge, and so I have to add uh, the usual disclaimer. Uh, the re my, my remarks reflect my personal opinions only, and uh, they are, will always be open to reconsideration based on uh, further reflection, developments in the law, and of course, any submissions I might hear in a future case. So with that um, out of the way, um, my desert island disc selection is a case on remedies in relation to legislation under section 52.1 and uh, section 24.1, uh, section 24 of the charter, section 52.1 of the Constitution Act. And, and it is the 2020 case of Attorney General of Canada and G. Now, um, I thought it appropriate to talk about a remedies case, um, at the very least, because without meaningful and effective remedies, all of the very important rights that my friends have just been discussing and that are entrenched in the Charter will be of little value um, unless you can gain some um, remedy uh, through the courts, um, those rights are, are barely worth the paper that they are written on. And so G is a case on remedies. Um, it uh, is also a section 15 case uh, to Jonathan's uh, points from a little bit earlier on. Um, and I'll just sketch out the facts of G very briefly because they do help to inform some of the, um, the court's analysis of the broader issues that I will be spending more time on um, in a few minutes. Minutes. Uh, Mr. G um, had been convicted, sorry, not convicted, had been found not criminally responsible by reason of mental disorder on a charge of sexual assault. The complainant was his then spouse, and the assault had occurred dur during a manic episode that Mr. G was suffering from. As a result of that, he became subject to um, the uh, uh, Ontario Review Board's uh, uh, jurisdiction, and that turned out to be a completely isolated incident in his life, 
And in the, I think now more than a decade since the incident, there had been no other problems uh, manifested in his behavior. Um, but he, be, by virtue of having been found not criminally responsible of a sexual offense, was required um, to be registered under both the federal and provincial sex offender registries. And what was um, interesting, uh, to say the least, about his circumstances was that he had no way to get off of those registries, have, being somebody who'd been found not criminally responsible. In contrast, had he been convicted of the offense and then later obtained a free pardon, his name would be removed from the registries and all of the reporting obligations that he, that are, uh, somebody on the registry is subject to would come to an end. That option was not available to Mr. G, nor indeed could he get um, a record suspension, which while a record suspension does not completely relieve you of your obligations under the sex offender registry um, legislation, it does reduce them. That option was not available to him either. He challenged um, those uh, pieces of legislation under both section seven and section 15 of the charter. Um, neither challenge was successful at uh, the trial level, but at the Ontario Court of Appeal, he was successful in his Section 15 challenge, but unsuccessful in the Section 7 challenge. So it's a bit of a flip to the, the usual scenario that, that Jonathan was talking about a little while ago. Um, the uh, Attorney General for Ontario appealed that decision to the Supreme Court of Canada, and um, the court upheld the finding that the legislation uh, infringed Mr. G's uh, Section 15 rights by virtue of treating him differently based on an enumerated ground, namely uh, the, 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 the characteristic or the, the personal feature of mental disorder. So that's the, the basic background to, to the case, um, but I, uh, which is interesting and important for Section 15 purposes, but it's also particularly interesting and important for remedial purposes. And so I, I chose um, G really um, for, for three reasons. The first was what I've already alluded to that uh, I thought it appropriate to talk about a remedies case uh, in this presentation. The second reason um, is that it, it was the court took the opportunity to take a step back and to try to discern some of the guiding principles that apply when remedies are sought in relation to legislation. Um, under Section 52.1, the, the, uh, the tools in the toolbox were always well understood. The declaration that a piece of legislation is inconsistent with a charter and therefore of no force or effect, remedies of severance, reading in, reading down. These were all well known, but they were somewhat lacking in principle you know, to guide their, their application. And so the court, um, uh, as I say, took a step back and reflected on what those principles might be, tried to discern some of those principles to make them more transparent and to offer some suggestions about how to balance those uh, principles when they come into conflict or into tension with one another as a remedy is being crafted. And so very importantly, the court um, uh, looked to Schachter, uh, which until G was really the leading case on, on remedies in relation to legislation and drew uh, some of the key insights from that case that have withstood the test of time, but also tried to update those principles in ways that, that reflect some of the jurisprudential developments that have occurred in the, I think, 30 some year, nearly 30 years since, since Schachter was decided. So the, 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 the third reason that I selected G um, yeah, is that, um, well, I guess at the risk of pandering to our host, the majority undertook this project of trying to discern the, the underlying principles expressly in response to an invitation from the Asper Center. The Asper Center invited the court to try to articulate a principled approach to remedies for legislation that violates the charter. And the court um, uh, very generously took up that invitation. And it really helped to, to, to fill a bit of a gap in the jurisprudence because um, unlike personal remedies under section 24, uh, which had a fairly rich set of principles that, that guided them, for example, with respect to damages and ward, with respect to the exclusion of evidence under section 24.2, originally in Collins, now in Grant, where there's a, a, a clear set of principles that, that guide the exercise of judicial, of 
judicial discretion. That was much less uh, the case under Section 52.1. And that, um, in part, had led to some somewhat anomalous uh, and, and unsatisfactory results uh, when dealing with legislation, <clears throat> particularly uh, when uh, determining whether to order a suspended declaration, um, to order a suspension of a declaration of invalidity. And that was, it seemed to be both um, uh, somewhat unprincipled in some cases and could lead, was leading to some anomalous results in some other cases. And so the court uh, really took up this, this invitation to, to try to identify these principles in, in, with the view to guiding the exercise of discretion in the future. And perhaps even more to the point from the Asper Center's um, uh, perspective is that when the court took up this invitation, they expressly adopted the Asper Center's approach. Uh, and not surprisingly, that approach was informed by Kent Roach's very important scholarship on um, charter remedies. And they adopted his notion of principled discretion as that which ought to guide remedial determinations. And the court, the majority, I should say, describes this as a middle ground between strong or pure discretion, which is largely un untrammeled and is simply uh, leaves a judge with free reign to fashion remedies as they see fit on the one hand, and on the other hand, a rule-based discretion, which would much more tightly constrain uh, what judges do when uh, uh, ordering a constitutional remedy. And so on the majority's approach, this principle discretion requires judges to consider multiple competing remedial principles and to resolve the conflicts and tensions that may exist between those in, an, in a given case, while justifying the prioritization that they give to certain principles over others in their decisions. And this is drawn directly from, from Kant's scholarship and indeed from the position advanced by the Asper Center in the G case. So the majority identifies four such principles when it comes to uh, remedies in relation to legislation. And, and frankly, none of them are, are surprising. And really, it would be surprising if any of them were surprising because what they were trying to do was draw principles out of the existing jurisprudence. And so the four of them are, first, that charter rights should be safeguarded through effective remedies. Indisputably true. Second, the public has an interest in the constitutional compliance of legislation. This is not a purely private interest on the part of the individual litigant who has brought the case forward, but it is an interest that is shared by the public at large that laws be constitutional. Third, that same public though is entitled to the benefit of legislation. And this is one of the, 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 the trickier areas that has that led to some of the um, anomalous results in, in uh, re, uh, remedial orders in relation to legislation, where there's a, a, a careful line that has to be walked between uh, granting a, an effective remedy in the, in, in the individual case without undermining um, rule of law principles and uh, more broadly or more specifically um, undermining the rights of others who are enjoying the benefits of, of at least the constitutional parts of, of legislation. And then the fourth principle that the court identifies is that um, the courts and legislatures play different institutional roles when it comes to um, uh, legislation. And so if we take a step back, as I've already indicated, the, none of these are particularly surprising principles, but there's a, a real you know, almost breath of fresh air as the court is, is quite um, uh, transparent about how they think they, they should be operate in, in any given case. And so we, um, uh, we as I've mentioned, the, the remedies of severance and reading down and reading in, um, those are all well-known um, uh, remedies, uh, the principle that they should be tailored only to the breadth of the, uh, of the um, uh, infirmity of the legislation also follows directly from uh, so the, the language of section 52 sub one. Um, but what the um, court draws on and, and urges courts now to, to, to be aware of is the need to ensure that the um, benefits of other parts of that legislation are not lost 
um, at the very least not during the time when Parliament is, re is reconsidering the matter. And that is very much what drives um, the adoption of uh, suspended declarations of invalidity. Equally, when, when looking at the, um, uh, the, the, the differing institutional roles and responsibilities of the courts and uh, legislatures, uh, this, is, this too is very well established in the jurisprudence, but it was um, uh, very helpful to have the court reiterate these principles and to remind courts that when determining whether to, to modify legislation through reading in or, or reading down, um, that it must always bear in mind the question, would parliament have adopted the legislation in the terms that are now being proposed or being contemplated by the court. And if it would not have, it would exceed the role of the courts to, um, to amend the legislation in that, in that way. And thus the more extreme remedy uh, of, of striking down the legislation is the appropriate uh, remedy in the circumstances. And so a, a, a well-known example of, of that is where um, in sentencing legislation uh, of mandatory minimums, uh, which specifically exists to take away judicial discretion to impose sentences, um, the, the constitutional, constitutional solution would be to um, uh, yeah, read in some judicial discretion, but that of course would exceed what the court would have adopted given that it was specifically um, to uh, take away such discretion. And so just on the facts of, um, uh, of G, uh, the court offers very important guidance and very helpful guidance on when declarations of invalidity should be suspended. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the dissenting justices criticized the principles as, as somewhat encouraging of ad hocery. Um, I would respectfully side and safely side with the majority uh, on, on, on this point. I think that at, at the end of the day, even though there's, there may be some compromise on predictability and certainty when it comes to uh, outcomes, um, which are rule of law principles, the interests of transparency and intelligibility and rationality that are really underscored by the majority. Those are also um, fundamental principles uh, for the rule of law. And um, uh, I think we, we also need to be careful not to overstate the impact on predictability because I think those values too will help to promote certainty and predictability in the law. And if we um, uh, return for the charter at 50, we can check and see how well um, this has uh, done for the for creating certainty and predictability as well as transparency and rationality in remedial jurisprudence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Norris. And now our final constitutional litigator in residence, Jessica Orkin, over to you. Thanks, Cheryl. It's an honor to be the latest addition to this uh, illustrious group of uh, constitutional litigators and residents. Um, as Cheryl mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to speak about a section that is not in the Charter, but is in the Constitution Act 1982, and that's Section 35. Um, so Section 35 obviously added to the Constitution as a recognition of Indigenous people's rights within the fabric of Canadian constitutional law. And I want to speak about uh, an originalist thread that runs within Section 35 um, and some co a court case that's coming up at the Supreme Court where the Asper Center is intervening, uh, which perhaps we hope will offer an opportunity to rethink this pretty well-rooted originalist thread within Section 35 jurisprudence. And so this originalist thread is really a, a tension within um, within section 35 and within, within the judicial understanding of what section 35 is about, between an understanding of the reason for protection of indigenous people's rights that's grounded in a view of indigenous people as requiring protection for their socio-cultural practices grounded in historical times versus a view, and I'm, I'm reducing this to a versus, of course it's not, but versus a view of uh, indigenous people's presence and rights as being grounded in a need and, and a recognition of self-determination and of self-government with a continuing and contemporary political salience. And the originalist thread is really one that roots Section 35 and roots the protections of Section 35 in historical practices and in the activities of people's uh, rooted in their presence on the land that is now Canada prior to the arrival of Europeans. Originalism is not our dominant 
thread of analysis or approach to constitutional thought. And uh, Justice Davies spoke about the living tree uh, view of other charter rights, and that is very much the dominant uh, perspective on how the charter is to be interpreted. But when we come to section 35, uh, a view that has rooted focus on pre-contact evidence and pre-contact protection um, is very much uh, dominant within the jurisprudence. And I think we can see that um, really throughout the jurisprudence, but very actively stated in a case of called Vanderpeet, which was the test, the case where the Supreme Court articulated the test for Aboriginal rights, how one identifies and proves the existence of an Aboriginal right. And Justice Lemaire for the majority said, what section 35 does is protect, is provide the constitutional framework through which the fact that Aboriginals lived on the land in distinctive societies with their own practices, traditions, and cultures is acknowledged and reconciled with the sovereignty of the Crown. The substantive rights which fall within the provision must be defined in light of this purpose. The Aboriginal rights recognized and affirmed by Section 35 must be directed towards the reconciliation of the pre-existence of Aboriginal societies with the sovereignty of the Crown. And that takes us only so far. What Justice Lemaire then went on to say is what this means is that we must look to the practices pre-contact to identify what is to be protected by Section 35. And so all of the evidence that must be put together by a claimant uh, Indigenous people when seeking to litigate and prove the existence of an Aboriginal right looks to pre-contact. And what is protected according to Van Der Peek test is what is distinctive in the society as it existed pre-contact. And this has led, this is an incredible burden within the structure of Aboriginal right. It's led to an incredible burden in terms of the historical evidence that must be adduced, in terms of the steps of continuity that one must prove to uh, tie practices, which evidently are going to be practices that continue to have salience today, but to tie them to pre-contact times. And uh, it's placed an incredible burden on the courts in terms of the scale of litigation that is required in order to create the foundation for a finding of a Section 35 right. And while there have been a lot of litigation successes along the way since the articulation of the Van Der Peek test, um, there's also been a lot of cases where the historical evidence put forward has been found to be lacking or where the right that is of salience for Indigenous peoples has not had that tie to the satisfaction of the courts to prehistoric to prehistorical times. And so when we look at section 35 and at that jurisprudence at, at, at Vanderpeet, the focus is very much on pre-existence. It's on grounding and restricting that protection to what is distinctive in the pre-existence of Aboriginal peoples before the arrival of Europeans and before the purported assumption of sovereignty by the crown over them. And this uh, structure has been criticized um, as being inadequate to protect the contemporary needs of Indigenous peoples and to protect their continuing existence, notwithstanding that purported assumption of sovereignty by the Crown over their territory and over them. And we can see a tension in some other threads of the jurisprudence um, emerging in more recent jurisprudence relating to consultation, for example, and in the discussion of what reconciliation means societally and for the Crown's obligations. And I want to point to an opportunity that exists in an upcoming case that will be heard soon by the Supreme Court in early December. And this is the reference regarding uh, an act respecting First Nations, Métis and Inuit children, youth and families, which is a piece of federal legislation relating to the provision of child welfare services for indigenous children. Asper Center has been granted intervener status along with some 30 other interveners. So this is perhaps a record for the number of interveners granted in the case. Um, it'll be heard on December 7th and 8th. And this act, uh, this piece of legislation by the federal parliament has include, includes and is founded upon a statement of affirmation by parliament as to the existence of an inherent right of self-government in respect of child welfare services that exists under section 35. And this is a statement by parliament that 
this right exists as a matter of constitutional law. And the legislative authority that is then described in the act is founded on the existence of that inherent right. And so, of course, the constitutional challenge, and this is another case of Quebec v. Canada litigating the question of what is the scope of Aboriginal rights. And we see the uh, Quebec v. Canada going back to the very beginning of our confederation when we look at how Aboriginal rights have been defined. Quebec has said, no, Section 35 doesn't include that. And so the courts are going to have to uh, adjudicate this question of the inherent right of self-government. Is, is this affirmation included in the legislation legally correct? The Quebec Court of Appeal, a panel of five said yes. And the position now advanced by Canada in support of that determination uh, by the Quebec Court of Appeal is actually quite remarkable. Uh, Canada is arguing Section 35 and an inherent right of self-government includes, and I'm quoting and translating from the French, but includes jurisdiction over any question that arises from the internal affairs of an Indigenous people, and that's necessary to ensure its survival and its flourishing as a distinctive Indigenous collectivity. And the scope of that broad jurisdiction and the self-government jurisdictions that would flow from it, um, one can imagine is quite broad, but includes child and wealth and uh, family services. And the Quebec Court of Appeal held that self-government rights under Section 35 analyzed as inherent rights are to be determined on a generic basis. And what that means is that they apply to all Indigenous peoples. Any and all peoples who have Section 35 rights have these rights. No ties to historical practices or customs must be proven. And you don't have to go back to pre-contact times to identify what they are. You instead look at the existence of the people and its needs for its flourishing. And so we see an arc here in, uh, in, in, in the evolution of Section 35, if this test is adopted by the Supreme Court. And I think part of that arc has to do with evolution of international law um, in terms of uh, UNDRIP, and uh, a recognition of self-determination and of the needs of Indigenous peoples not being purely socio-cultural practices. We'll see whether the Supreme Court adopts that, that perspective, um, but it will involve, if it does, quite a significant change in the jurisprudence around Aboriginal rights. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Jessica. So um, we don't have very much time left. I said that I would, at the end, comment on a couple of cases involving Joe Arve. I was going to co comment on three, but I'm going to, given the time, uh, I probably will only um, have time for two, um, but I'll do them briefly because I do, I do think we need to, to acknowledge the kind of work that he did. But I want to focus on um, two cases that I think have to do with access to justice for those who are bringing forward constitutional claims. I mean, there are so many cases involving Joe Arve that have already, we've already heard about that we haven't really mentioned. I mean, he was part of Andrews and, and uh, has been, um, has really um, had an impact on equality rights and Aboriginal rights. Um, but the, the cases that I'm, I'm going to focus on are about public interest litigation itself and the constructs of, of the construction or, or strategy behind litigation. Um, the first one, some of the cases have also involved the Asper Center, but the first one I'm going to start with is one that was before our time, that Little Sisters, because um, I think that uh, that's a case that's been so kind of identified with Joe that uh, it would, I'd be remiss in not commenting on it. Little Sisters was a bookstore in Vancouver that was being harassed by Canadian Customs, ostensibly for the content of the material that they were importing for sale. Um, this case was the second challenge to the government action following a decision by the Supreme Court that indeed their rights had been infringed, but which failed um, to order any remedy that would prevent it from happening again. So getting at some of the issues that Justice Norris has talked about, talked about in terms of the importance of remedies, there was a declaration, but that didn't really prove to be much help because it happened again. And Joe, on behalf of Little Sisters, a struggling small business that made little profit, sought advanced costs to launch uh, or to, to respond to the um, defense that the, the government of Canada was mounting um, with all of its resources. And he lost. And the case had to be abandoned. 
So it stands for me as a significant blow to access to justice and a case that continued to motivate Joe Arbe in, lit in his litigation strategy going forward. He intervened um, in other cases. I mean, he had, I mean, this case was based on the Okanagan case that came before it where advanced costs had been ordered. Um, but uh, he, he intervened again in Carroll, which was a language rights case where advanced costs were again ordered. Um, and he also sought costs after the fact in a number of cases he took on. And I've heard him speak and, and, and know his views is that while he did an enormous amount of pro bono work, he also believed that lawyers and the organizations that support public interest work should be compensated. He, was sub he uh, subsequently obtained um, special costs in the Carter decision and just made it um, and it just may be possible that the Supreme Court is opening up to these types of awards. If the most recent award in the Council of Canadians with Disabilities case is any indication. Um, that case is, um, is significant because of the second case I wanna talk about, which is the Downtown East Side Sex Workers United Against Violence case, which was about public interest standing. Joe represented the applicants in this challenge to the provisions of the criminal code related to sex work. A key argument uh, in the case um, was the infringement of section 15. However, due to the challenge by Canada to standing in this case, Bedford was the decision that reached the Supreme Court first and ruled the provisions of infringed section seven. And so we were left without the section um, 15 analysis, much like as, as Jonathan has commented in Carter, we don't, we have, we, we're missing that analysis. But the downtown Eastside sex, um, sex workers case represented the progressive approach to public interest standing that allowed for the court to be flexible and look at the full context of the issues at play. It acknowledged that difficulties that individuals might have in mounting a challenge based on their own private interest, especially when, they, when what was being challenged are criminal provisions that placed them in jeopardy as it was the case in downtown Eastside case. And it looked at whether the case was a, was a reasonable and effective way of bringing the case to court, not the best or only. And so the court essentially adopted Joe's arguments in the case uh, in this regard. And, and most recently, the Supreme Court re-emphasized the flexible approach in the Council of Canadians with Disabilities, another case that the Asper Center intervened in. We also intervened in the downtown Eastside sex workers case with a with a bit more of a radical uh, approach, uh, whereas Joe took the more mo moderate one, which the court adopted. So, um, and then the, the final one, I mean, a third one is the Bedford case, and I won't really talk much about that, except that Joe represented us. And, and one of the, it was one of his motivations, I think, for coming to the Asper Center was to be able to make this argument, which was around stare decisis and the role of precedent in constitutional litigation. And it was a, a, um, an argument that I um, very much um, agreed with and really sought out his, his guidance on. And the court had acknowledged the Asper Center's arguments and adopted them in, in allowing for uh, in horizontal stereotypes, allowing trial courts to take a fresh look at cases. Uh, in that case, Bedford, they were looking at the, um, the prostitution reference as a precedent. And later in Carter, it was the Rodriguez case that would have bound them to find a different decision than they ultimately did. So the Bedford case really did open up trial courts to looking at some of these things afresh. So those, I, I mean, it's been, it was such a pleasure to work with Joe, but it's also, as you can see from all of the people that have spoken today, it has been my pleasure to work with all of them uh, in the Asper Center. It's one of the, the um, perks of the position is that I've been able to um, reach out to and engage um, some of the, you know, the leading litigators in, in, in the various areas that you've heard about today um, in the Asper Center and the students have ben benefited um, so greatly from, um, from their wisdom, their experience and their views on constitutional litigation. I, we don't really have much time for questions. I note that Nader um, Hassan had to leave and couldn't stay to the end. And we had one question in the Q&A about positive rights, which is one area where um, we just really, I mean, we could do a whole other session just as long um, talking about whether, um, uh, you know, what looking to the, ne the next 40 years as to whether or not there will be some development in that area. 
um, and many people are fairly pessimistic about that, but, but uh, certainly his mature um, litigation in climate change is one place where we may be hearing more about that. I had also hoped we would ask a question about criminal law, because we really, uh, except on the periphery, haven't really addressed some of the really significant criminal cases. And when I asked Nader about that, I said, if there was one criminal case he wanted to talk about, he would stay stinchcomb. And, and I think I'm sure everybody would not, which is the case that really established the, the, the obligations on government to disclose the case that they have against the accused and in ensuring a fair trial. And that and the, the implications of Stinchcombe cannot be underemphasized. Um, and another leading case that Joe took on, which was the Henry case that the Asper Center also intervened in, Stinchcombe was, was there in the backdrop because um, Mr. Henry was wrongfully convicted. And one of the issues was the, the lack of disclosure of, of information that, that the Crown had. So I'm going to wrap up now and say thank you to all of our constitutional litigation residents. Uh, I think this has been a bit of a masterclass in, in the last 40 years of the, of the charter. And uh, we hope to um, edit somewhat and potentially use this as an episode, uh, a bonus episode of our podcast. For those of you who aren't aware of the Asper Center's podcast, it's called Charter, of course, and can be found on all episode, um, all of the sort of major podcast um, uh, stream uh, streamers, uh, including um, Spotify and Apple and all of those things. But you can also find a link on our, our website. Um, and so many of the topics that we've talked about today um, are we get a more in-depth analysis on our podcast. So thank you again, everybody, and thank you for for joining us um, on this webinar. Uh, it's been a bit of a tour de force.